Hello, and welcome to the program. This is the Black Ponder. I am Neil Trotter, and I want to welcome you to the show. And today, well, first of all, <laughs> uh, you know, look, check out the lo-fi setting here. <laughs> the Black Ponder has always been a lo-fi show because we just focus on the content rather than the aesthetics. I just say it as an excuse because I'm lazy. I don't want to pay for expensive uh, camera equipment and lighting and all that. So, you know, it's the time of the year where the lights are going away earlier and, you know, natural light is, is, is fading away. So I have to use more artificial light and I got some cheap artificial light. So, you know, you got to make do what you do. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, in this video, we're going to continue our series as to why is this channel called The Black Ponder rather than just simply The Ponder. <laughs> And, you know, I know, I, 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 I won't stop. I can't stop with the series. I think it's very important. I, maybe some of you are sick of it, but I'm not sick of it. And I think it's important. And I think we need to bring philosophy toward that direction. It's true. And we're going to do that via a discussion about ableism. All right? Ableism, that is the oppression, discrimination based off of one's ability. You know, we're talking about disabilities. And we're specifically talking about what's known as like invisible disabilities. Like you, disability is that when you look at a person, you assume that they're not going through issues or struggles. They don't have a disability, but actually they do. And how that's a form of erasure, that assumption, and this idea that that's a normal thing to do, that that's what we're supposed to do. You know, we're supposed to ignore, not acknowledge, dismiss uh, disability, and not acknowledge somebody's struggle and suffering and you know the issues that go with uh, dealing with a disability. The reason why that's important to focus on specifically in a philosophical context because it's a dismissal of truth, right? And we're denying a person's truth, which is a denial of their identity, right? So again, we're also going to be talking about philosophy of identity here. You know, it's a form of erasure. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about that too. And we're going to do that via a discussion of this text right here. Man, you can't even see it. <laughs> let, me, let me get it up close. Yep, see, now that's a good thumbnail right here. It's called The Collected Schizophrenia by Esme Wayun Wang. And this book right here, it's a, a you know, critically acclaimed <laughs> New York Times bestseller. You know, if that means something to you. Uh, it's an excellent book. It's an excellent book because it's about uh, the, the author. It's a memoir, a collection of essays where she discusses her experience with mental illness, specifically a variation of schizophrenia that she has. And she's talking about the misconceptions and the, you know the assumptions that are wrong and you know the trials and tribulations and the struggles that she's had to go through because of this mental illness that she has but more importantly and what we're going to focus on in this video is we're going to talk about how it affects her identity and that's where it kind of gets a little controversial which is sad you know i, I don't think it should be controversial but it is it's taboo and in that way, it ties into the series. You know, I call myself the Black Ponder, and people think that's controversial, it's taboo. Like, why you gotta bring race into it? <laughs> well, you know, being black is part of my identity. No, it's not. You know, you can separate that. You're just a person that's interested in philosophy. You're a philosophy enthusiast. You're not a black enthusiast. You're not a black a philosopher. You're just, you know, you're just a person that's interested in that. But I would argue that being black affects the way I understand philosophy. You know, the black experience has shaped my identity in such a way that I interpret philosophy differently as opposed to if I wasn't black, I would be interpreting philosophy in a different way. It gives me a unique perspective and that shouldn't be denied because it gives a, a unique point of view that's needed in the world of philosophy. Likewise, this author's experience with her disability, her mental illness, has shaped her identity and is a part of how she exists in the world. You know, and to deny that, to just not acknowledge it, to dismiss it, is a denial of identity. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I begin with the first quote that I picked from this book. Because here in the Black Ponder, we do quotes. <laughs> we read, read quotes. If you're new here, we read from the book and then we add supplementary commentary, which we then continue in the comments below. But I'll read, in case you are following along, you, got, you actually have this book, because people do request that I do the page numbers. I say that. We're on page 70. And here we are at the fourth paragraph here, at the very end of the third line. In the language of cancer, 
people describe a thing that invades them so that they can then battle, you know, quotes, the cancer. No one ever says that a person is cancer or that they have become cancer, but they do say that a person is manic depressive or schizophrenic once those illnesses have taken hold. In my peer education courses, I was taught to say that I am a person with schizoaffective disorder. A person first language, for quotes, suggests that there is a person in there somewhere without the delusions and the rambling and the catatonia. But what if there isn't? What happens if I see my disordered mind as a fundamental part of who I am? If it has, in fact, shaped the way I experience life? Should the question be a matter of percentages of my lifetime? I spent enough of this lifetime with schizoaffective disorder to see it as a dominant force. And if it's true that I think, therefore I am, <laughs> this, you know, Rene Descartes quote right there, Perhaps the fact that my thoughts have been so heavily muddled with confusion means that those confused thoughts make up the gestalt of myself. This is why I use the word schizophrenic, although many mental health ad advocates don't. So Wang here is talking about person, what is it called? Person first language, which is a thing in like when, when you talk about mental health, when you give like speeches about mental health and you know, there's a whole discussion about that and best practices and there's this whole idea that person first language is supposed to be used because you want to separate the person from the disorder or the illness you're not bipolar you're a person with bipolar disorder right you're not a depressive right you're a person that is dealing with de depression and in that way you acknowledge the person as a person that's the idea behind it but the issue with that was what wang is saying is that you're not acknowledging that experience. You're kind of being dismissive about it in a way. You're saying like, well, you're a person and you can just get over that. You can separate yourself from that disorder, that condition, that illness. You know, in that way you kind of belittle it, right? You don't, you don't acknowledge it as the person's experience and how that, that, that illness has shaped that person, how that person has, their identity has been shaped by that experience by that mental illness, for instance, or that experience really is what I'm getting at. The experience is not being acknowledged. And you know, we have to be careful here and not glorify the mental illness. You know, say like, oh, this is so great that I have this mental illness and it's really shaped me in this way and now I can understand things better. You gotta be careful about that, right? Because, you know, pain, suffering, it shouldn't really be glorified. <laughs> you know, that's not something, you know, I believe a person doesn't have to suffer to be great, right? Which is kind of a notion that you hear often. What I'm saying is it's important to acknowledge somebody's experience and also it's important to acknowledge what somebody's going through, right? And, you know, understand that what they're going through, whether it's mental illness or race, for instance, uh, is what shapes their identity. So in a, it's part of their identity. So what I'm saying is experience is a part of identity. And let me read you, this is some notes that I wrote in the margins here to try and understand what's being said here. Uh, dehumanizing the disabled part of the human experience. Okay, dehumanizing that part. Saying like, oh, mental illness, you know, schizophrenia isn't like a part of being human. That's just something that we should separate from the human condition. And you know, that leads us to all types of problems. Like now we're not effectively helping the person that's dealing with the schizophrenia or the mental illness or addressing the realities of race, for instance, like being black, like, oh, that's not even part of being human, so let's just dismiss that, <laughs> right? That, that's the issue. So you're kind of dismissing somebody's identity. You're dehumanizing that part of the person. And I'll continue with my notes here. Uh, shunning that part of the experience as human, denying truth. So let me continue here. I'm on page 71, and I will begin here on the third paragraph. There might be something comforting about the notion that there is, deep down, an impeccable self without disorder, and that if I try hard enough, I can reach that unblemished self. But there may be no impeccable self to reach, and if I continue to struggle toward one, I might go mad in the pursuit. Yep, so that's what we're getting at here, what Wang is saying is, okay, so eventually the goal is to get to the point where there is a, pers there is a person that you can reach that doesn't have mental illness in her case, 
but that's something that she always has to deal with. And let's say we eventually do find a cure, you know, for schizophrenia or these mental illnesses. Let's say that does happen. Uh, that, but this, this still the, the trauma of the past experiences that will sh has shaped her. I mean, she'll never get over that, you know. Trauma is something that affects us always, you know, and, you know, and not just trauma, just past experiences, whether that be suffering or, you know, whatever happens to us in the past. Even though we've dealt with those things, perhaps, um, they still affect us even today. You know, we still are shaped by those things um, presently and in the future. So again, to deny that would be to deny one's identity. So there really isn't a self that can separate you from your experience. If you take away that experience from that person that you are, like the experiences that you've dealt with in the past, uh, you become, you're a different person. <laughs> you're not the same person. That's somebody else. That's not you. And you really have to question, is that really possible? And here in my notes I wrote, society doesn't help disability because it casts disability as inhuman. It dehumanizes that part of disability. You know, people, a person that's suffering from schizophrenia, when we see that suffering, when we see somebody going through that, that's, they, they, it's separated from being human. Society looks at that suffering as, oh, that's not, that's not a person, that's not a human, because we separate that from the human experience. So we don't properly help and uh, offer assistance and address and actually look at that person as a human being with you know, an, that human experience. And this is what we mean when we talk about ableism, where we're dehumanizing the disability. Like, oh, that's not part of what it means to be human. Once we cure that or find a way to get that person away from that disability, remove that disability, then that person becomes a human. But before then, they're not a human. And see, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> that's what we're getting at here. Disability is something that should be acknowledged as a part of being human. It's a human experience that shapes identity. So let's continue. I'm going to go jump all the way forward here to the second quote that I picked here, and it is on page 145, and I'm going to start on the third line. So again, she's talking about the, the experience of her mental illness. She prepares you by saying that, you know, I'm going through this thing right now, this, this psychosis that's happening to me right now, it's, it's happening. And, you know, I will read the quote here. What the writer's confused state means, okay, talking about Wang's talking about her, the author, she's in a confused state right now she's dealing with a mental illness, is not beside the point, okay? It's not beside the point. Because it is the point. I am in here, somewhere. Cogito ergo sum. <laughs> Cogito, you know, it's that Latin phrase that's famous, I think, therefore I am, by Renee Descartes. What she's saying is the mental illness that she's going through uh, influences the way she thinks. It does, like, you know, and that's not to like glorify the illness or to say that the illness is something that's good or bad. We're not trying to downplay the bad parts of the, the mental illness and the suffering that she goes through. You know, let's, we, we're definitely acknowledging that. But we're saying, but also we have to acknowledge that this mental illness influences the way she thinks. And it influences the way she thinks about the world and you know interprets the world in that way it's it's part of who she is it's her identity she would be a very different person if she didn't go through that mental illness so the way she thinks is what makes her who she is that's you know it's a we're talking about renee descartes here this philosophy right which is why i brought it up i'm like oh okay it's got definitely some philosophy here i need to talk about this it's something that shouldn't be dismissed or not recognized or pushed aside as like, oh, that's, that's not who you really are. No, that actually is who she is. Okay, now we're going to skip down to the fourth to the last line here. Still on page 145. We speakers were told that we are not our diseases. Okay, she's talking about how she gives speeches about mental illness, that she goes through mental illness and now she's gonna talk about it and you know do work, lead workshops about it and talks. And she went through some training uh, on how best to uh, talk about mental illness, like a workshop. So she says, we speakers were told that we are not our diseases. 
We are instead individuals with disorders and malfunctions. Our conditions lie over us like smallpox blankets. We are one thing and the illness is another. That's what she was told. Again, this person first language. The uh, intention might be good behind it, but it, we have to understand uh, the real effect of that type of interpretation. When you're saying that, oh, you're one thing and the illness is not, then you're separating the illness from the person. You know, you're denying the person that experience. You're like, oh, that, that you know, th this mental illness that's happening to you is not actually part of who you are. All the things that you've dealt with, all the suffering, the tribulations and the things that influence you because of your mental illness, uh, that's not who you really are. That's not who you really are. You're something outside of that. <laughs> But the, the issue is when that has affected you in such a profound way, <laughs> when you, it basically has shaped your identity and you know how you interact in the world, uh, that is who you are. And so what we're getting at is, you know, it's a denial of identity, right? It's a form of erasure. And that's part of what ableism is, this, this idea of, you know, oppressing someone or discriminating against someone because of their disability. And part of oppression Part of discrimination is a denial of who they are as a person. That has profound effects on a person to deny somebody that the experience that they're going through is actually real. <laughs> like, you know, it's actually, there's truth behind that experience. People just say, oh no, that's not, that's actually not what's going on. You know, that's not, this is why, you know, health, mental health is so taboo and the healthcare industry is, you know, leagues behind what it should be in treating mental health because it, does, it still has a difficult, time understanding that mental health is, is real <laughs> you know these experiences are actually hurting people you know there's, there's suffering there's true suffering that goes with these experiences and they they need to be taken as part of the human experience so i put in my notes here in the margins are our identities separate from our conditions not only our conditions but our circumstances and you know, our attributes and the things that we have to deal with, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, uh, these things that we have to go through are part of our identity because they are part of our experience. Mm -hmm. So one of the philosophical points I'm trying to make here is that experience is identity, it's, part, it's a huge part of identity. So let me read you the third quote I picked here. We are on page 150. This is the fourth to the last line. Who is this alleged person? Quote, who is a person living with psychosis. Once the psychosis has set in to the point that there is nothing on the table, save acceptance. When the self has been swallowed by illness, isn't it cruel to insist on a self that is not illness? Is this why so many people insist on believing in a soul? And what Wang is talking about here is, okay, you deny somebody that the influence of psychosis. How they interact in the world has deeply been shaped by this experience of psychosis, which a lot of people deal with. We want to deny that from the human experience. Like, oh, people, you know, mental illness is like a thing that you can overcome easily. It's about mental strength and, you know, all you got to do is do some intense physical training or whatever or, you know, some deep philosophical reflection or some spiritual awakening and then you could uh, defeat mental illness right but as you know most mental health sufferers will tell you including you know somebody like Wang she says this in the book here um, it's not how it works <laughs> you know mental illness is, is a part of who you are so when you deny that when you take that away what do you have left you, you really have nothing you have something that's not you and then she proposes like oh is that why they, people talk so much about a soul because when you strip all that away, all that experience, you're left with something that's not you, right? So is that like what a soul is? Or that, that's where this idea comes from? But then in this course, she also talks about there is nothing on the table left except acceptance, accepting the mental illness as part of your identity. And again, we're not trying to like glorify mental illness to say, oh, this has given us uh, special powers or like the the suffering that's happening due to mental illness is profound and you know we need to embellish that like no, that's not exact you know that's not what we're saying specifically again let us acknowledge and she goes into detail about this the pain and suffering 
uh, and tribulation and hardship that she's gone through because of her mental illness, which is very important to acknowledge. But on top of that, we also have to acknowledge that that pain and suffering is real, right? You can't separate that from the human experience. Like That's something that she had to deal with. And many people with mental health disabilities have to go through, and it really shapes them profoundly. And it uh, you know influences the way they think about the world and the way they interact with the world, and it influences who they are as a person. And it, that's important to acknowledge that as real, as true. You know, that is part of their identity, the good and the bad. So I think the, the point is, is that we as a society need to acknowledge the reality of mental health illnesses. We have to, as a society, acknowledge the truth of mental disability because it's a, it's a true thing. It's, you know, it's something that affects people's identities. The struggle of mental illness is something that a person deals with in a real and true way. It is part of their experience as a human being. And in, today in our society, we don't see mental illness that way, just in general. You know, when you go to like a major medical facility, you know, or the, the medical health institution in general, you know, there's so much problems with people getting, di getting the right diagnosis, people being taken seriously when they say they have mental health issues. And, um, you know, just in general public, people say, I'm dealing with this. And then there's so many people that are like, oh, yeah, that's not real. Or why don't you just get over it? Or like, why don't you just do this or do that? Or, or like, that's not who you really are. You know, you can just do this and do that. And then you can become who you truly are. <laughs> right. And then it's really, it's just a form of erasure. It's a form of you're not being taken seriously. The truth of who you are is not being taken seriously. And again, I just want to tie this all back to you know, when people say, why don't you just call yourself the ponder, <laughs> right? Why you got to throw black into the whole mix, that race issue? Well, you know, what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to highlight this issue that society is dealing with, this issue of erasure, you know, this e issue of denying somebody's truth, denying somebody's identity. You know, it, it, you see it in race and you see it in uh, gender, you see it in sexuality, and you also see it in mental health. <laughs> you see that too. And you also see it in uh, the treatment of people who are struggling with disabilities. Right? You see that denial of like, you know, you, d you see that rejection of, of humanity when you're talking about people who are dealing with disabilities. You see that dismissiveness. And it's just a denial of truth. It's a denial of who we are as human beings. And you know, that's a huge part of why we as a human species are just, you know, we're just hitting this wall, this ceiling. We're not able to go to the next level because we're not even acknowledging huge amounts of our experience as human. And we're not including that as part of who we are as people. It's all about accepting truth, you know, and understanding the vast diversity and variation of the human experience, which is all valid and very important. And that's what we're talking about here. This is an excellent book right here. Uh, honestly, one of the best books I've read this year. The Collected Schizophrenia by Ismay Wei Yun Wang. Check it out if you want to know more about schizophrenia in general and like all the misconceptions our society has about it. And if you want to experience a very deep and thought provoking discussion about mental illness in general and the experiences of mental illness and you know the problem our society has dealing with mental illness. Also, if you're trying to uh, look for a deep discussion about ableism, this is a great book. This book is definitely addressing a very important topic that our society is not even close to dealing with or coming to terms with because we're still in the denial phase, sadly. But it's books like these that, you know, in the, in the face of denial, bring us face to face with truth. And that's important. That's why I wanted to highlight this book on this channel because that's what philosophy is all about. You know, un uncovering the denial and looking for the meaning behind the truth. Well, you've been watching The Black Ponder. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thought.